uh, account interested for the mystery is Israel you know uh, you declare uh, how many atomic weapons they have or is it a taboo you cannot touch them uh, because they brought this nuclear uh, uh, plants and all in the Middle East. So, why don't you use the same system now you're trying on other countries? Is it taboo to, uh, and you are not, you didn't, don't declare it. So, what is the, the reason? Yeah. Might be an answer to this. Yeah. Yeah, so everything is based on agreement and treaties. Israel has not joined a non proliferation treaty like India and Pakistan. So, therefore, they have not placed all their nuclear installations for international monitoring and verification. So, the only way to uh, deal with Israel is either uh, they uh, denounce their nuclear capabilities and do away with their nuclear weapons and join uh, nu uh, nuclear non-proliferation treaty as a non-nuclear weapon state. This is article not very likely option to come. But there is another treaty which is under discussion and this is called the Fissile Material Cutoff Treaty, which I have been involved in the last two years, where these countries which have nuclear weapons, they commit themselves that they stop the production in a verifiable manner, and then they go to the disarmament, which needs another treaty. But uh, in a way, we will cap it, and the countries which go to this category are North Korea, India, Pakistan, Israel, and then those five nuclear weapon states. And uh, those negotiations have been stuck for the last 20 years. And uh, now, finally, they were able, after 20 years, to form this group which I was party to and we went through the uh, last two years uh, kind of a you know, verification protocol which the French government last week turned to a model treaty. It still needs to get these countries to agree on that at the negotiation start. So that will be the uh, next step. Then there's one more initiative here and this is the Middle Eastern uh, zone of free of weapons of mass destruction. It's actually originally was a nuclear weapons free zone in 1970s and this proposal was done by the Shah of Iran and then seconded by Egypt. That has also been stuck because of the political situation and uh, those negotiations have been now more, more uh, active in the last few years, but unfortunately they were not able to get to this uh, meeting where the foreign ministers were supposed to meet. And, uh, this, uh, uh, there's a facilitator from Finland, uh, Ambassador Laajava, so he will report his findings next week to the NPT review conference. And now it depends very much what happens next, that uh, whether you know, they get this meeting with the foreign ministers and start to look how to deal with this problem. Uh, there, <coughs> this is my personal view. Uh, actually, Iranians and Israelis have been sitting on those meetings, but there has been a problem on the, some of the Arabic side that there has not been unity for other reasons. So I hope that we get over this hurdle and then one can start to do more focused talks. And this will cover then all weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological, and then uh, also nuclear plus their delivery vehicles, which means missiles or whatever you will use. So it would, it would be very comprehensive. But I think a lot of time is still needed when we look what happens in this region in these days. It will come. And uh, I hope it will change then also Middle East. But most likely, uh, before we get there, some things in the Middle East need to be changed. So this is a little like a chicken and egg. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation, especially the introduction you gave on I, IAEA, your organization. 
uh, we were consumed all the time by sort of political argument regarding this very delicate and very complicated and sophisticated issue. Now, your presentation here might raise a number of real questions regarding the agreement between the 5 plus 1 and Iran. Uh, my question, my first question, and maybe so many other questions raised by your presentation, is whether you and I, AEA, have the capacity or the manpower to control the requirements of the agreement or the accord which should be reached by you between Iran and the West and the 5 plus 8. The, the second question related to this, why is the Congress uh, concerned about this matter, which is an agreement between Iran and five or six independent states? Uh, I don't know what is the political side of this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Well, certainly, IAEA has all the resources, provided that it gets them from the member states, because IAEA is the organization from the member states. If the member states feel that this is a task IAEA can take, B5 plus 1 cannot decide it on the behalf of IAEA. If there is an agreement, it will be brought to the IAEA Board of Governors, there will be a debate, mm -hmm. and then Mr. Amano will say, present a budget and a kind of vision how, how he thinks this is to be done. I don't see this as a huge task. When I compare, for example, the activities which we had in the beginning in Iraq, or activities in South Korea when we went, sorry, South Africa, went to verify the dismantlement of the South African nuclear program, or verification in a large nuclear fuel cycle like in Japan. So it's a different type of task needs different uh, specialties. IAEA has to get some additional staff with the staff with the special skills, skills and funding, but I think it's a doable. Then I think an important thing is here that the rules of the game are established very clearly from the very beginning so that the IAEA can do a good job. So it's not something which is half done, but it's well defined robust verification uh, scheme which has chances to to succeed technically <coughs> not only politically but technically and there are lessons to learn like you know the limited access in North Korea which actually led to some of the unfortunate situations so there are a lot of these technical details which need to be sorted out and then the second question was Congress. Well, Congress. Well, well, that's a complicated. Yeah, that's a complicated thing. Uh, I have been invited to testify there four times during the last two, three years, and I'm I'm not an American. I'm just a simple Finnish chemist. Yeah? So the way I see, it, first of all, there is a <coughs> difference in view on the policies between the president and his party and the Republicans. That's fair. <coughs> fair to say. But then, also the democracy, that actually this is a very important decision, this Iran, because the U.S. has been advocated a uh, long time that the sensitive technologies like uranium enrichment and reprocessing should be only used by the countries where there's a real need for them and justified need. And they have discouraged uh, countries to go for enrichment. You remember the one, two, three agreement, for example, signed between the US and uh, the Emirates. So there's a special paragraph there with, where, uh, to a certain degree, Emirates forego the enrichment option, not entirely, but faster. So this has been the US policy a long time. And now that all of a sudden you have a country which has broken the international agreements, uh, uh, has perhaps <coughs> a reputation of uh, supporting terrorism and other activities in the Middle East, and they can have the sensitive technologies to that size that makes them to a nuclear threshold state. Keeping also in the mind that even though the number of centrifuges goes to 6,000, the other 30,000 are still sitting there in the warehouse, so they can be put back. And uh, uranium production continues. So these are the things which uh, uh, also the, the people from the president's party have raised that 
Are we able, first of all, to do a good verification in Iran? But it sets a precedent, particularly to the Middle East, which has some other troubles, and also to the rest of the world. And particularly in their mind is North Korea and South Korea. And as you know, South Korea wants to have uranium enrichment, and now it's very hard for the U.S. to go to say, yeah, yeah, you, you can't have it, but okay, Iran can have it. Mm -hmm. So this, these are important decisions, and that's why I understand that the, the Congress wants to have a say on this, because President Kokopsen, but the Congress stays and the country is responsible for this. But there are no easy solutions. <coughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ali. My question is very short and simple. Iran has uh, has enriched uranium up to a level of 20%. How much time does it need to increase its concentration to 90%, which is uh, capable, which is capable of uh, making nuclear weapons? With, with using its existing facilities. The existing facilities, if they can use all of them a few weeks. Two weeks. Two, three weeks. 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 Two, three weeks. Few weeks. Yes. Depends how if they use all of their 19,000 yeah. 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 Not under the agreement. Yeah. yeah. And, the and, and why yeah. it goes then so why they are signing the agreement now? Mm -hmm. To stop it. <laughs> to stop so it. And, and, and the thing is that you know, I didn't have time to go to the nuances, but uh, when you have natural uranium, it takes about 5,000 of those centrifuges to go from in one year to a nuclear weapon material. Enough for one. If you have this more advanced centrifuges, uh, you need only 1,000 of them instead of 5,000 for, for, for one year. But then it depends also on the level of enrichment you have. Because this is when I say when you start with uh, natural uranium. But if you already have this, uh, let's say, 5% enriched uranium, actually you have done 60% of your work. You are more than half away. So any of those numbers which I mentioned get cut to half. But then comes the 20% enrichment. Actually you have done 90% of your work. So uh, it's not, it sounds 20% is uh, far. Uh, a low number, and many academics in the U.S. they say it's a medium and it's uranium. I said this is a wrong understanding because it's like, it's not a glass which is half full or half empty. It's a glass where someone has only taken a sip because 90 percent of the work has already been done. So this is the reason why this agreement uh, also says that Iran should not have this 20 percent and it's uranium. And there is no technical or economical reason to produce it either. And why I say so? The world is full of highly enriched uranium as a legacy from Cold War. There are hundreds of tons of weapons grade uranium with no use. They are not anymore even uh, in nuclear weapons in, uh, in Russia and in the uh, US. So you take that 90% enriched uranium, you mix it one to four, and you have fuel for research reactor for decades, if not hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So I don't see any reason for anyone to produce new 20% and it's uranium. And just burn it in, in top, uh, normal reactors and do away with it. That's the way, <coughs> the way to go. Well, <coughs> my name is Menachem Hajj, I have three questions. Yeah, the first one has to do with the design of the agreement itself. I'm not a specialist, but I have a problem um, conceiving the order of magnitude of the time horizon. Uh, it's only 10 years to take Iran to a certain threshold of, you know, a certain legitimacy in, in using nuclear um, facilities. It is like a deferred green light, in my opinion. So could you shed some light um, on the rationale behind why why 10 years? Because if you buy a flat in many countries, they'll give you 99 grace period, 99 years. So why why 10 years? It's practically nothing. And you give it the colossal consequences of, of, of that implication. The second question 
is um, have to do with uh, with uh, if, there, if there is any sort of non-physical or nuclear clauses or milestones such as human rights or civic rights that uh, Iran has to comply with in terms of the treaty. Is there anything of that sort or are we going to see the same Iran as we see it today after 10 years enjoying the new status? <coughs> the third and last question is on your take on the consequences of um, the agreement on the on the foreign policy of the GCC countries and what sort of strategic options they have because again 10 years is nothing in the life of countries do you think they will move their act together somehow and develop certain more serious nuclear options or, or do you think we're going to see the status quo more or less thank you Hard to say, so that's a lot of one. But uh, let's go one by one. Yes, this is uh, Iran remains as a nuclear uh, weapons threshold state. It got le le legitimated to this because of this agreement, and I think it sets it a bad precedent because I don't personally see any technical or economical reason for Iran to keep this kind of enlistment capability. But negotiations are giving and taking. And Iranians are good negotiators, and their negotiating position has been recently very good. And if you look at where they started in 2003, it was a very bad situation, but they have been able to turn the tables. And now the negotiators, when they went here, they have to take something, give something, and then they, want, they ended up with this containment thing. And there is a report which uh, I think you got a copy which has all these past red lines. We have a diagram in our report where we say retired red lines. There are about 10 of them. So 10 concessions came year after year there. And then as a technical person, you know, I share your concerns not only from this uh, timeline point of view, but Actually, Iran has not changed the course of its nuclear program. Why? They keep this uh, enrichment there level which is higher than needed. But at the same time, they have, there is no indication that they want to address this military dimension. I uh, came again empty-handed back two days ago. So I think that the Iranian leadership has not changed the course. So they probably save it for 10 years from now. And then 10 years is a short time, it's a long time. Iranian nuclear issue has been in front of us from 2002, so 13 years. I once, there's this Sehera uh, and 1,000 days and 1,000 nights story. This has been more than 4,000 nights, this discussion. And I don't think that they still fell in love with each other. Mm -hmm. On top of that, as Seherat said, and the king had done. So, we, we are going to have this problem there for, for a while. What should the Gulf countries do? Uh, uh, well, you have your legitimate uh, nuclear programs, and, uh, and the only advice is that play according to the rules of IA and that you don't get some <coughs> trouble. But, uh, Gulf countries, each to, to better or individually, they are have a right to nuclear, uh, you know, program. And I have particularly paid attention to to Saudi Arabia, and I have seen that they are busily building their nuclear infrastructure to support this 16 reactor program which they have, and they have concluded now in last one year. Uh, nuclear cooperation agreements with Argentina, South Korea, France, Jordan, about six or seven, and Russia. So probably will do with China. So they start to build their infrastructure. It doesn't mean that they go to nuclear weapon, but uh, as one of the Russian negotiators said me, summer 2003 at all, you know, when I said, why do the Iranians do all this? They say, 
they said that look first where they are. Take your school map. Look, you know, they have a nuclear weapon state here, they have a nuclear weapon state there, they have a nuclear weapon state, they are surrounded by them. So they are probably worried about their security. And then he said that what they are now doing, they are climbing up on the nuclear ladder so that they are high up if they had to do a political decision to go for weapons, it would be shorter time. And I think that this is what we have seen, and they have been pretty successful on that. And they did it with small steps. People were annoyed, there were political turmoils, but the, it was very measured step at time, and that's why these 10 uh, red lines got passed. And I think that you have uh, important decisions in front of you, how you plan to uh, have your security. Excuse me. Any questions? Yes. Uh, my name is Khalid al Mazian al Hajri. I'm very happy that I be here. I have two questions I would like to just explain to you briefly. Start with the second one. Uh, from the point of environment, we are living in the same area, which is a real concern to the neighbors of Iran. So, what was what? Uh, was the main concern and consideration to take prior to the agreement to Iran as these places are very close to our area and as now days as then the climate and global warming is effect it's a serious it's a serious concern about that the second question and the personal question to you what is the pro pros and cons from your personal view to get out from this agreement. Thank you very much. Well, we said, start from the last one. This uh, agreement has strengths, but it has weaknesses. And I think that some of those uh, weaknesses can be mitigated now, still in next two, three months in this discussions to have, you know, more tougher <coughs> provisions for the verification and undertakings and compliance. Unfortunately, I don't think they can go down with the centrifuges or dismantle them more thoroughly than what, in a more irreversible way, because that would give much more time. <coughs> but uh, I think it's a hard to get. Then, <coughs> Iran, nuclear safety and all this. Yeah, first of all, Iran is an earthquake prone country and there's a, in the middle of the country there's a kind of belt where you have less earthquakes and actually many nuclear installations are there so if you look Natanz and uh, Lashkarabad they fall to that more stable belt Boucher perhaps not it's in a more difficult position I think that uh, what here is not part of this agreement and this is again, I think that this is a take and leave, and they be, the negotiators felt that it's not necessary at this stage for this agreement. But I think that the Iran should uh, conclude this uh, nuclear safety convention with the IAEA and invite uh, international <coughs> peer reviews to, to certify that these nuclear installations have been built according to the international standards and are operated according to those standards. And then whenever there is an emergency or any kind, that they have adequate procedures also for that. And this is, I think, is the minimum which they should do. And it's unfortunate that they have not done because this is the only country in the world which operates a nuclear power plant and has not concluded such, such convention. Uh, I think that this is also what, uh, you know, cool GCC perhaps can encourage in your bilateral relations Iran to do it if this P5 plus 1 doesn't do it, which it appears to me. And the other reactors, they are a little bit in a better shape than Bushes since they are much smaller in size. So if there is a trouble, it's probably a local trouble. And then uh, the fuel site facilities, enrichment, fuel fabrication, if there is some 
industrial accident. It's a very local, it's almost inside the building, so we should not have overly concerned of pusher and the next power plants which they are building to push area area and then dark coming. I think those should get a uh, very good international scrutiny before they build the new ones. Thank you, Professor Parvasada. Um, if I may, now, if we observe the Congress, if we observe uh, regional players such as uh, Israel, uh, it seems they are not happy with such agreement. But what we don't know is what are the alternatives. I mean, if no agreement, then what? Is it realistic? I mean, even the military scenario, what can it achieve? Uh, is it even realistic? What can you take out? What can you, what can you do about this program? And I help you understand in a layman's term, now it's because there's a bit of confusion where they are, what can they achieve? If you draw resemblance to something as mundane as cooking, for example, it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, so they've got the ingredients, they've put it together, and now it seems they have the oven, they can bake the cake, but they're just putting it in the fridge or freezer for the time being, but they're ready whenever they decide. They can put it in the oven and it's ready. Is that is that resemblance kind of uh, uh, what, what's happening today? And if we want to draw that comparison. I think uh, it's already half-baked. Half it's it's half-baked. So that, you know, pre-cooked. They, uh, yeah, pre it's, it's not entirely cooked, but oh these God, days, <laughs> they produce this 20% in rich uranium, and uh, this is 90% of the work done so they understand how you deal with the uranium enrichment when you get to the higher enrichments because the centrifuges behave somewhat differently they are on the top end but i think that they got all the necessary information from dr Carr, and these people have been working now with these centrifuges a couple of decades they are very talented young motivated people so there's no doubt in my mind that they can do it if they ask to do it and since it's uh, half cooked anyway. And then the first question is the military, I mean, yeah, the, military. when the Congress or Israel yeah. opposes this problem, what's the alternative? Actually, for me, this is not a question necessarily between peace and war. There are also uh, <coughs> things in between. And one typical thing is this sanctions regime. Yeah? There is a pain in Iran clearly now, particularly this banking and swift sanctions. So that uh, do they uh, have an impact? On the other hand, then, is the Iranian wish and will that whether they really go to the higher enrichment, because it will have also consequences. Uh, much of their support comes now from the non-aligned movement who see that, you know, Iran got the technology and the big powers don't let them to do it. They want to monopolize this, and this is a so south north, south, east, west, all these ones. But if they go to 90% enriched uranium, I think that some of the support, particularly from the heavyweights, like India, uh, South Africa, probably start to disappear. I don't see that it's in their interest to support such a development. So Iran has to calibrate carefully that. Then, are there other things than than uh, sanctions or total <laughs> war. Well, there are all kinds of restrictions and sabotage. And uh, for example, I mentioned this uh, Iraqi nuclear program. Well, certainly the Gulf, first Gulf War destroyed a lot of the infrastructure. There's no doubt about it. But much of this inf infrastructure was uh, destroyed by Iraqis themselves. Because when the threat came, they started to move these very delicate instruments away, like flow-forming machine and precision lathes, away because they knew that this is going to be bombed. They put it under bridges near Tashi and uh, some parking lots. Then, when the war was over, they took them back. <laughs> there was another threat, so they had to pull them again. They did it three, four times, and some of this equipment is very delicate. 
So they use their tolerances, and then they are not anymore good for the centrifuge production. And the only, only, only way to get them back is that actually the manufacturer comes and does the replacement, or you, in the first case, you need to buy a new equipment. And since these are very hard things to get, like flow forming machines or precision uh, lathes, so uh, if there is anything like that, it will push it more than two years. And then it depends also one can do some uh, kind of pointed actions perhaps, which also delay. So it's a very difficult to say uh, if there is a military option which is not a total war, which can substantially change the mind. <coughs> then Iran, on the other side, Iran has a parliamentary election next spring. I think the government probably wants to have some kind of agreement by then, because the young people there, they might be a bit upset if there is no agreement. So there are many parameters here, and it's hard to say which one is, but it, it's a, it can go either way, and it can also go to worse. I, I would like to thank uh, Professor Hernanian for his uh, excellent presentation, and, and I also like to thank the audience for their interesting questions and comments, and uh, also the thanks goes to the Coit Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences for allowing to have this presentation and uh, this uh, honorable guest with us. And I would like also to thank the uh, Poetic Economic Society for having this forum. And thank you, all of you. And thank you thank for you being with us. Thank you very much, Thank you.